How's uh, how's Phil doing? Uh, Phil is great. Uh, Phil is thriving, still learning, uh, like any sort of, I guess, AI solution. Uh, Phil will always be learning and improving. Um, the uh, Phil experience has evolved a ton over the years. We really started uh, Phil as kind of a, a face to our matching and recommendation engine. Um, people have actually come into the office, into the reception desk and said, you know, I'd like to talk to Phil, Phil's help them <laughs> out. So, um, you know, we've had to clarify sometimes that Phil is Phil is not a, a human with a cubicle in an office anywhere, uh, but Phil continues to uh, to get better. We're doing a lot right now in improving how job seekers onboard. In particular, we want to make sure that we are learning from them more acutely. There, there's two ways to learn, like information that the job seeker provi provides like very explicitly, and then information that you learn implicitly from their behavior. Um, and we spent, I we've, I think we started building out our ML AI capabilities about 2015 or 16. So we yeah, you guys are really on in that uh, in terms of... Yeah, you mentioned the the uh, Tel Aviv Israel office. That that's where really where that that work started uh, back in I think 2015 when we started uh, building out that team. Um, and you know they, a lot of good computer uh, and data scientists um, in the, uh, Israel. And so we've really tapped into that network well. And we started really on learning from implicit behaviors, and we want to do a lot more as you can kind of see here on the screen and, and get a lot more sort of explicit job seeker input. Yeah. So when when I choose the three options here, I'm I'm looking for a job right now. I'm looking for a job with no rush. I'm just browsing. So what are the differences here between if I choose one of these versus the other? Can you give me an example? Yeah, you you, you can kind of experience it a bit, but I'd say just if you take yourself, uh, put yourself in the position of a career advisor as a human career advisor, and if you had somebody that came to you and said, uh, Chris, I'm looking for a job right now." You would think about the world a little bit differently than you're like, hey, I'm actually pretty, if your friend or whoever it might be was like pretty content, but, you know, maybe looking for an upgrade when the right opportunity presented itself, your your sort of levers or your filters would be a little bit different in terms of urgency, in terms of willingness to, you know, look at different comp levels, willingness to maybe drive further or commute um, or work from home and all that. So I'd say it's a it's an influence on the different tolerances for the types of jobs you might show somebody. Yeah, I chose, uh, I'm looking for, I'm just browsing. I take the marketing manager. So I'm going through the process here. It's almost like you're pre-screening applicants before they get to the job, which I think is interesting. Yeah. And that's going to really help you just drill down on the um, the quality of Canada, right? That's really what it comes down to, I think. And in particular, I'd flip that around a little bit. I would say the applicability of the role to the candidate, right? They're kind of the, maybe two sides of the same coin there. Yep. Yeah, totally. Uh, but uh I kind of like that this that approach, you know, it's just it's really going to help you just drive more quality applicants to the uh, to the employers out there. That's right. People who are like it's kind of well what they're doing already, right? The employers are already pre-screening like this. It kind of makes sense for you guys to do it too. Yeah, and and you happen to be here on the desired minimum pay screen and like why why leave that for the last conversation in an interview? Get that out of the way up front as early as possible. Yeah. I want 200k, Bill. Uh <laughs> Uh, very cool. Um, by the way, I think Phil, you know, Phil could probably be like a, an AI voice someday. You guys thinking about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, the sky's the limit on what we're able to do here, especially with sort of the advent of a lot of this uh, LLM generative AI stuff, um, which we are using to help with um, resume development, job description development, uh, basically the things that we kind of all know uh, Gen AI is really good for, getting people started with some content um, and getting that dialed in from there. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I do think that uh, you know, think a lot about the future of job search, and I, I got, I got a feeling that you know, voices is somehow going to be a part of this. Whether it's you're interacting with a, you know, voice job search coach like Phil, or uh, you are uh, just speaking what you want to look for in terms of uh, just to, into a, your into your phone and getting jobs that way, right? Um, do, yeah, do and guys, are you, do you guys have like a skunk works there, or do you guys work on some on some of this stuff, maybe? Yeah, testing a lot of stuff behind the scenes. We do a lot of like a lot of job seeker A B testing to see what clicks. And if you think about uh, some simple examples, it would be understanding for different job seekers just the, the input mechanisms. Do they want to do voice? Do they want to do web? Do they prefer to do text? Um, so there are some simple things around adoption, around those types of capabilities. And then the types of questions people are comfortable answering, the types of questions that we think they might be answering truthfully versus very aspirationally. So, you know, you put in 200K for the salary of somebody uh, was sort of fresh out of college and uh, maybe had a, a non-technical degree and they're looking for 200K a year. Maybe that's highly aspirational, but not too realistic. Yeah. 
Um, uh, let's talk about remote jobs for a minute. Uh, they seem to be getting, uh, well, the, the remote jobs are, you know, because of COVID and the pandemic are the most sought after now and they get a lot more applies. You guys seen that internally and, uh, yeah. have you guys addressed it at all as far as like breaking out those remote jobs for candidates? Yeah. And there's some different experience stuff we've built out to help both the, uh, employer make sure it's very clear which types of jobs are remote versus have uh, like an actual physical location requirement. And then from the job seeker point of view, we've definitely seen, uh, more interest and demand from job seekers for remote jobs. Not always in sort of, I'd say not all of those folks are going to be able to work a remote job. So there, there is a natural sort of um, constraint on what jobs can be remote, done remotely. I think that's pretty clear. Um, so I'd say probably the uh, demand from job seekers outstrips the supply of remote uh, positions as far as I'm aware. I don't know the numbers specifically on that, but that's my my understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, so there, there's going back to the aspirational point, I think some job seekers are just aspirationally trying to get get into that remote work life. They probably hear their you know, cousins or their uh, some other family members talking about how awesome it is. Uh, and they, they want a little bit of that experience. Yeah. Um, you're a competitor, uh, tried to launch a paper application last year. Um, uh, I'm curious, do you guys, th what, did you, what did you think of that move? I mean, do you have any kind of personal opinions on it? And, um, did you guys ever look at that as well? Sorry, that was on for, for pay, uh, for PPA, like paper application type of oh, paper application. Uh, yeah. yeah. Models. Yeah. Yeah. Paper application is, is, uh, a challenging model. Um, we've experimented with some different models on the enterprise side of the business, uh, over the years. One of the big issues um, is for uh, non-integrated, non-sort of ATS integrated campaigns where the job seeker is applying through the career site or through the ATS. Um, the tracking of those application signals is going to be increasingly challenged by some of the uh, privacy constraints that are being dropped into the browsers, Chrome, Safari, et cetera, um, and into the operating mobile operating systems in particular um, with Android and iOS. And so that model gets a little bit flimsy from sort of a tracking point of view. And I think the the model that one of our competitors launched required a lot of work from the employer. Um, and you had to really be on top of things to make sure that you weren't paying for what you didn't want to pay for. And then you get into a little bit of a um, finger pointing debate on like, well, I don't want to pay for this application or pay for that application. And I think that distracts from what we're really trying to get at, which is, are we, are we putting butts in seats? Are we filling roles? Are we getting people hired? Um, and if we're sitting there haggling over CPAs and which apps get paid for, it's very distracting from the end goal. And I, I, we're not really a big fan of introducing that distraction. Yeah, I tell all my job board clients, look, once you send that apply click over to the employer, you've done your job as the job board, right? It's up yeah. to them to convert them at that point. I think a lot of employers feel to realize that, you know. And that goes back to my earlier point on trying to help um, look at data to, to help guide our customers and help them be more effective. When we can collaborate and take sort of our data, which would be, you know, impression to maybe click out or maybe a captured apply if we're integrated with their ATS, and then take their data from their ATS and look at the apply and all the post apply behavior, we can paint a really good picture. Um, we can help them understand where they can be more effective, but we can also take a little bit more responsibility for beyond the apply click or beyond even the apply, because we want Phil here to make sure that he's learning. Um, if I just lean into that uh, AI roll a little bit more there. We want Phil to learn and make better recommendations and understand maybe some more of the, the behaviors and the nuances that might correlate with somebody who's just clicking out or, or even applying to somebody who's going to get hired. Uh, so that full funnel visibility really helps us optimize things. Yeah, definitely. Um, do you think guys, you guys will ever purchase another you know major job board out there and kind of try and consolidate the market a bit overall? I've always thought that, like I've, I've gone on record saying like, you guys should buy career builder or monster or some of these other guys and just, you know, leverage those, those other platforms out there that, uh, that would help you guys. But, um, what, what have been your expansion thoughts here in, in the market, if at all? Yeah, I would say we're really focused on organic growth at ZipRecruiter, um, as much as we can. I, I, I mentioned earlier, some of the stats on our organic job seeker growth, 40% last year app growth. So really trying to invest in our core products, our core branded products, people having uh, job seekers in particular, having an experience with ZipRecruiter as the job search brand. Um, we we uh, have made one acquisition in the past that was jobboard.io. Um, Christian, the sort of founder and kind of sole proprietor of that business is still with us today and is a key part of our, our uh, strategic team. So um, we've done that, but, but otherwise I think, you know, we're really going to be looking for organic growth. Gotcha. Okay. 
Um, so what have you learned in your, in your journey here, Matt? It's been 10 years now. Uh, what have you learned about the, the overall job search process? Cause, it, Cause it's still broken out there. If you ask most job seekers, but what do you, what do you tell, what do you tell the regular job seeker when they can, when they tell them you work at ZipRecruiter, what do they, what do they ask you about? Yeah. Uh, I'd say everybody has, everybody knows the name. So when I bump into somebody new and, you know, eventually work comes up, everybody knows the name. People have their favorite sort of way that they've heard the ads, depending on the radio station or the podcast or whatever it might be. So I'd say that the awareness is pretty ubiquitous. Um, and depending on who I'm talking to, if it's somebody who, for my, my prior career in ad tech, um, I get to say it's much more rewarding to work in an industry where we're helping get people hired than just, you know, sell widgets or increase CPMs. Um, but there was kind of this joke 10 years ago when I joined that this industry was 10 years behind ad tech. I don't know that we've actually made any, any material gains on the employer side, um, maybe a couple of years. So I they say we're now maybe further than 10 years back in terms of the sophistication, but it's a different industry too. So I don't think it's a fair comparison. We're not just slinging impressions. We're not just trying to get people to buy things. We're actually trying to get, you know, recruiters and job seekers together and get roles filled. So I think maybe where we're at from a tech point of view is kind of okay in many ways. On the job seeker side, I think there's still a ton of room for improvement. And a few things stand out. Um, as you saw in the last screen that you had pulled up, like we're not just throwing a big search box in front of job seekers anymore. We're trying to learn more about them, primarily because search is hard. People don't know what to type in. If you know that you are a marketing manager and that is like what you want to do next, you might know to type that in. But a lot of people are just very skill trans, very skill transferable, if you will. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is learn more about what they're capable of doing and then introduce them to or expose them to more jobs that they might not be aware of. And I kind of look at that as like, I, I want to be more of like the Netflix of job search where you sit on the couch, you pull up your Netflix app on your smart TV, and there's just a bunch of recommendations. And some of those recommendations are contextualized, like, hey, this is new or it's trending now or you're getting recommended this because you watched Iron Man or this because you know you watched SpongeBob SquarePants or whatever it might be. So some of that contextualization, but Netflix learns from your behavior and then tries to get you to watch more stuff and keep you engaged on their platform. And that's how I would look at what we wanna do, not throw up a big search box and say, good luck to you. We hope yeah. you know that there's this random job out there you've never heard of before because you've never been exposed to it. So for me, that's like the big broken thing. Yeah. Well, you, you talk about the Netflix experience. Like, why don't you guys have an app for Fire TV? I could sit there and browse ZipRecruiter while I'm uh, in between commercials and stuff. Uh, I'll add sense. that to the roadmap. <laughs> Good stuff, Matt. Well, I appreciate you joining me today. It's been a it's been a fun conversation. Anything else you want to you want to leave for the audience there about uh, 2024 and ZipRecruiter? Yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll make it a good year. We've got a lot of good stuff in the pipeline, um, a lot of good things that will we'll, uh, come yeah, can, out with. Can we expect any new features from you guys from whether the job search perspective, the employer perspective this year? Absolutely, both both on those. Um, and we are really going to continue to focus on making our core product much better. Um, we might look at some, some investments and some other solutions, but really just make that core product better, make the job search better for the job seeker and make the sort of candidate engagement process better and faster for the recruiters. So I'd say a lot of what we're going to be focused on is that speed component. Can we get people applying to new jobs quickly? Can we get recruiters engaging quickly, get roles filled quickly, get people placed quickly? Um, so not to beat that uh, like a dead horse, but I think that's what we're going to focus a lot on. So you'll see some stuff come out that is both visible and talked about, and you'll see some stuff that's kind of behind the scenes and more invisible, but very tangible if you are an engaged job seeker. Sounds good. Well, again, appreciate your time, Matt, and thanks for joining us today here at RecTech. Thank you, Chris. Thanks for having me. Looking for your next HR technology role? Go to your browser, type in hrtechjob.com, and browse hundreds of jobs with the best HR technology vendors. HR tech professionals finally have a dedicated job marketplace to find work or be found. Sign up for job alerts or post a resume. Discover jobs with companies like Workday, Phenom, HiBob, Deal, and more. You'll even find HR tech roles with employers in case you want to work with managing HCM or HRIS platforms. HR Tech Job, the only job market for HR technology careers. Join us at hrtechjob.com.